You are listening to WCAT Radio, your station for quality Catholic programming. Your selected program will begin right after a word from our sponsor, Group M7.com, a web design and hosting company. Log on to Group M7.com today and let them know that WCAT Radio sent you. You know, my finest childhood memories was the Saturday morning movies for about four bits each. My brother and I could split a Coke and a big box of popcorn and watch movies about Tarzan, Jane, and their Amazon River adventures. Well, maybe that's where Jeff Bezos took his name. His Amazon.com is now the largest online retailer in the world. I'm Michael Malfood with Group M7, the oldest and largest website design firm in East Texas. And here's my point. And as usual, it's a good one. If your website is modern and up-to-date, mobile and search engine friendly, it matters not whether you sell a product or provide information about your goods and services, your sales justifiably will increase just like theirs. The world uses the internet. We can improve your website and your email. Look at our giant portfolio at groupm7.com. Since 1995, there's only one web and there's only one group and it's us. It's Group M7. You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, everyone. Welcome to part two of Christ's Dialogue Method of Gospel Witnessing with Romal B. Simeon, Foreign Mission Catechist and Street Evangelist, as well as authors of Love Letters from Your Father, the Biblical Books of John. God bless you all. And we will start this second segment with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, pray that you pour your Holy Spirit upon Romald, inspiring him to deliver the message that we most need, each one of us. Write on our hearts with the pen of your Holy Spirit, Lord, and open our minds and activate our wills to follow your gospel command of witnessing your truth to our brothers and sisters. I ask this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Welcome, Roma. Welcome. God bless you. In Jesus' name. I read a portion from Love Letters from Your Father that talks about the good news. First letter of John, chapter 4. The good news, gospel gift, is a free offer of an incomprehensible grace to each person, each Christian. A multiple gift of love. First, you have a direct relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In baptism, you have citizenship in Jesus' messianic kingdom. You are a soldier of Christ. You began on earth with a personal association with Jesus' saving mission, why he came into this world, and continuing throughout eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Love letters from your father. The Gospel of John. In the first segment, we talked about what people see as a difficult part of witnessing. They hesitate to witness. So they say, how do I do it? And they are actually ritual Christians. They go to church, they worship, they have an interest in the sacraments, they receive the sacraments of baptism and confirmation, matrimony or holy orders, but do they actually go out of that church? They are internal Christians. They're they're ritual. They're within the four walls of the church. When they go out, they are 
just normal people. They say, well, I'm Catholic. Are you different from the people of the human culture out there? No, we're also subjected to it, to the seven capital sins. Very, it's hard to distinguish a Christian out into the world from the one that's in church. Yet, when we talk about the early Christians and the Christians of the gospel, Christians of previous times, we're talking how people recognize them as being different. People in their culture saw them as being different. See how they love one another. See how they reach out. See how they proclaim Jesus. That is not what we are doing here in this life. Now, so it seems difficult to them. Now we're going to show you what is the ideal. And strange enough, the ideal is easier. When you read the scriptures, you're talking about the apostles. You're talking about the early church. You're talking about St. Paul. And you're, and you're seeing the, the era of the martyrs. Now, we want to see now how Jesus is the gospel. Do, our, do we really image Jesus? Witnessing is what is the problem. There is a lack of witnessing in today's era. We're too much like the others. We're too unchristian Christians in the world. Witnessing is the first and most primary active content in the Bible, in all of the Bible. The prophets all witnessed. And they were, it shows you the problems of witnessing, how they were opposed, and how they overcame it with the promise of the Messiah, with the presence of God in their life, of Yahweh in their life. They all looked forward to a way that would be perfect. And that is what we have in the New Testament. God finally, almost like exasperated with the lack of constancy in the people of the Bible, of the Old Testament, he decided to send his own son, second person of the Blessed Trinity. His image, his, he, his humanized image of himself. And Jesus said this very clearly. I mentioned that in the first segment. If you see me, Philip, you see the Father. I am the image of my Father. I am his witness. The one you can see now with your human eyes. And I'm going to teach you how to begin to see it with my eyes. I'm going to transform you into me. So the divinity was humanized in Jesus Christ so we could see his, him as a human ideal, the perfect witness of God, visible, tangible. And now he transforms us. His goal is to transform us into images of himself. So when people see us, you begin to see Jesus. They just don't see the human being because they see it. They, they begin to look with the eyes of faith. What is not tangible there is insightful in, with the spirit of God. Now that's what we're trying to do to them. We're trying to be that image of Jesus, the extension of Jesus in the world 
in this kingdom of God. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we can look at five areas. We could call them the five temples of God. Four in this world and the fifth one in heaven. The first temple of God that we have in the Old Testament so clear is Moses. The temple of liberation where they went out into the desert, detached themselves from the paganism around them and had a clear area, a desert area. And Moses actually put a physical temple there made as a tent with wood. All right, we call these the temples of God. And the first was Moses in the desert when he called it also a tabernacle of the covenant. And that was the temple of liberation. It lasted 40 years. Then he went into the Holy Land and he decided to build Solomon's temple. Temple that we talk about so much. The temple of celebration where the Jews were now were settled in the Holy Land. And God came into the Ark of the Covenant and spoke to them in the temple, and they worshipped him. Then that was destroyed by the invasion of pagans. And they went into exile for 70 years. And they returned to build a third temple. The third temple is a temple Sometimes it, we tell the physical temples as a second temple, but it's a third temple, the third temple in progress. And that was a temple that they said now that Jesus would come to this temple, even though it would be built like a fortress, not as beautiful as the temple of Solomon, that Jesus would come to this temple and he would become the light of that temple. And that is the one that we have in the Gospels. But then Jesus said, they rejected him. They rejected him and the temple would be destroyed. And I will rebuild the, the temple in three days, which means now his resurrection and his resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit comes a third, the, the third temple and the third temple is Jesus himself. He becomes a temple. He becomes the presence of God in the world. He becomes the mover. And he calls it the kingdom of God. He establishes that kingdom of God. And then he passes it on to his apostles, to the human church, to the human Persons who are his images. It's not the human church of people who are humanized or connected to the human cultures, but to the divine culture in the world. Thy will be done on earth. On earth. The kingdom of God. Hello, everyone. This is part two of Christ's Dialogue Method, learning how to witness the gospel as Jesus did. We're going to start with a prayer again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, I pray that you pour your Holy Spirit upon us. Open our ears that we may hear. Write on our hearts with the pen of your Spirit and inspire Romwald to give us your word, Lord, what we each need individually to quicken our spirits, enlighten our minds, 
make us aware of opportunities, and give us the Pentecost boldness to reach out and witness to our brothers and sisters with love and caring, to be in tune with them, and to do it in a dialogic way. Show us how to do that, Lord, the way you modeled it for us. Thank you. In your name, Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Take it away, Romuald. Okay. Greetings, hey, seers and seekers of Jesus Christ. Hey, we want to turn you into activists, active Christians in witnessing for Jesus. First, I would like to give indication from love letters from your father, Alexa Davina, that have written on John's Gospel. It says in first letter of John, chapter 4, the good news. The Gospel is offered as an incomprehensible grace. It's a multiple gift of love. First, it's a, a direct relationship with God through Jesus Christ, sacramentally, through our repentance and our baptism and the sacraments. But then it is at the same time a citizenship to the God, to Christ's messianic kingdom kingdom. He established his kingdom on earth, the kingdom of Messiah, beginning with his personal association with Jesus' saving mission. And then it continues into eternity. So we're talking about that connecting to him and the saving mission. And that is what we call witnessing with Jesus. In the first segment, of this talk, we were talking about personal witnessing and trying to encourage people to do personal witnessing. And they see how difficult it is. They say, how do I connect? Oh, I can go to church. I can worship in church. I can be a ritual Catholic. But when I go out into the world, out of those doors of the church, how do I reach people who are outside? How do we uh, reach people in my family? How do I reach my family and friends? How do I reach with people at the workshop, at the workplace? How do I reach people in the human culture? The human culture, which is committed to the seven capital sins. So the worldly what we call the worldly people. How di difficult that is, how to make connection to them, how to talk about Jesus to them. Well, we gave that in the first segment. That seemed to be difficult and we had to explain it at, at, at infinitum. But now we come to the, what should be the easy part, where we are image of Jesus where we connect to him. Not, not just with the eyes of human beings, of looking at ourselves and being concerned about what people think about us, how they react, but to see how Jesus did it and how he shows that he did it in the Gospels. And that is why it's easier. We have a model. We have teaching. We know exactly what there is, the message that is to be given. And we know exactly how he did it. And so we're going to look at that. The apostles were, were with him for three years and they received much of the teaching. Gradually he was, he was witnessing to them how he did it how he connected to the people who needed to develop and become messianic. They were not so sure. They were doubtful. They were deficient. They were with them, 
and went without him. And it's so clear that after the three years, they did not even witness with him at the cross. Even though they declared it, that they would even die with him in his witness. Instead, one of them was a direct adversary of Jesus who betrayed him, Judas. And the others hid themselves into the upper room, afraid that they might be crucified with Jesus, except for one John the Evangelist, who, encouraged by the presence of the Virgin Mary, joined up with her at the cross and witnessed for Jesus by his simple presence. Not as a, his vocal action, but with the action of his body. So we can say that we are in this world not to witness ourselves, but to be instruments of witnessing, to witness Jesus. He came to witness his father. So we see now, when we go to the Bible, you have to have that in front of you. You have to be conversant with the Bible. The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the prophets were those witnesses. They witnessed the coming of the Messiah. They witnessed the presence of Yahweh in the world. It was an up and down expression. It was not a straight road because they were oppressed by the spirit of the world and the pagans. But there was always that hope that the ideal person would come that would show them and be the actual witness of Yahweh. That was Messiah. He sent his own son into the world, his own son in human form, a humanized divinity so that people can see, they could hear, they could observe, and they could imitate that witness. That is where we're at. And he established the kingdom of God on earth. The kingdom of God, a church, a community. And he sent his apostles to form and activate that community with the power of the Holy Spirit. So you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit activated in in. in making this effort a witness so that they could be proclaimed. We could connect to them. And in connecting to them, you learn how to connect to those who are searching for God, those who are away from God, those who are the lost sheep, those who are the persons who are desiring to do better. So this, we are now becoming in our uh, in our temple of the world that we are in, we are to be that witnessing extension of Jesus Christ. That was all given in the first segment. Now we're coming to this second segment. Let's give a a metaphor here. The temples of God that we can observe in this world or we hope for. The first temple of the witness of God that is so strong, of course, from Adam and then to Moses. The first physical temple was Moses. And Yahweh established on the te- basic on the Ten Commandments and he liberated the Jews from paganism, the paganism of Egypt, and sent them out to the desert. And there they built a physical temple, a temple called also a tabernacle, uh, like a tent with the Ark of the Covenant. And there they worshiped God and focused on that 
for 40 years to become his witnesses to themselves, to learn themselves how to witness. Then they were, that was the temple of liberation. Then there came a second temple where they moved out of the desert into the Holy Land, into the promised land, and then established themselves against the worldly culture of the pagans who were there. And they cleared it out. And when they cleared it out, there was a celebration, a celebration temple, the Temple of Solomon. In the Temple of Solomon, they worship God peacefully. And in that temple, they connected to God and developed themselves. But then that temple was destroyed. It was destroyed by the reaction and invasion of pagans again. And they went into exile. And when they came back after seven years, the 70 years of purification, they came back and there was a temple of purification and defense. It was like built Nehemiah and Esdras it was built like a fortress. And that temple, they cried and said, this temple is not the glory of Solomon's temple. And he says, don't worry about it because the glory of this temple will be the Messiah. He will come to this temple, the third temple. And Messiah came to that temple. For three years, he preached and witnessed to the Jewish people. And he showed them that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, who came now to witness his, the presence of Yahweh. If you see me, you see the Father. You see me, you see the Father. I am the witness of Yahweh, the glory, the light that build, will continue in this world. But that temple, the people of that temple also destroyed him. They refused to accept him. So he established the fourth temple, the temple of the kingdom of God, an active temple. A temple built on himself, living temple that will continue to the end of time. And that temple will be his presence. Not just his humanized presence, his sacramental presence on the apostles, on the people of God. And that is the temple in which we are now living. And that temple has its ups and downs. It has its times of great progress. And it's the temple of great witness. And sometimes there is a downgrade of that witness. And that is what we seem to have today. And a caving in, a silencing of that witness by the people and the cultures around us because many of the Christians are compromising the culture of God with the culture of men. And we're going from one to the other. We have those committed to the culture of God that are exemplars and ourselves at times when we sin, the those who fulfill the temple of the, rather the culture of humanism, of secularism. So we're trying to now in our witnessing to restore the kingdom of God as priority. The fifth, there's a fifth, fifth temple that is not here yet. That is the temple, the eternal temple of God, where the human temples, the, the 
temple of rebellion, the temple of sin, the temple of destruction, the temple of compromise is over with. And that is what our hope for in the future. That is what we're working for. Establishing the kingdom of God in heaven. The kingdom of God through Jesus Christ and through our own active witnessing in order to bring as many people to God and to the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ, that they may receive glory with Christ, the images of Jesus, and restored to heaven, which was the original tension of God. Now, we want to say in this witnessing that we have to become those images of God. We have by becoming images of Jesus Christ. We have to join that way, the truth, and the light. And we do that by our own repentance, by listening, and by modeling Jesus. So, listeners and seekers were saying this, put your name into that of Jesus. We, by suppressing your worldliness, by raising up Jesus, so you are an image of Jesus. That is the effort we have by you, ourselves becoming those personal witnesses, we can go out and be witnesses of Jesus to others. That as people see us, they begin to see Jesus. We have to put our name into it, our minds, our wills, our actions. And that is the process that we are now describing. Jesus came to be each our human perfect example. The perfect one. The sinless one. The one who does it all correctly. And he does it by fulfilling our own needs. We are subjected to our wants. We are subjected and we go from one to the other. We go from the human culture to the divine culture. Back restored in Jesus and God's redemptive forgiveness. And we come back to it and he goes up and down, up and down, not a straight road. We're looking for the straight road. And the straight road is only in Jesus. And what is deficient in us now that Jesus gained for us to become true witnesses? A new Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit, so that each person can become a a human, a humanized sort of a divinity because when people look at us, begin to see Jesus. Now, that's when we know that we are witnesses. We're not witnesses, but we're like everybody else. We're not witnesses, but what they see with their eyes, what they see in action, they see with our in, uh, work in life that we are just another human being. So we have to act now to be Jesus present. We only have this short time in life, each one of us. We only have this human presence of the church in the world, the Christian community, and the time that we have in the human existence 
in the, our worldly existence. That will all be changed. Book of Revelations will all be changed, will all be taken away. And there will be no, there will be the fixed world of God in heaven, the fifth temple. So we have to talk about our present situation how to become his witnesses. We have to have a new attitude, a Christian attitude. We have to be Jesus in action and make Jesus in action and seen through us. It's embarrassing in the human race today. We are the militant church in this world. We're not the glorified church. We're the militant church. We're the soldiers of Jesus Christ. He establishes this kingdom. And through baptism, we commit ourselves to his rule, not to the rule of Satan, not to the rule of the world, not to secularism, not to eliminate God, but to proclaim him and to describe him. People will say, I can't see God. I can't see God. They're thinking with their, their own minds. They're seeing with their own ears. So we have to ourselves think with the, with the mind of God, the mind of Jesus, to act with the hands of Jesus, to walk and talk with the words and the movement of Jesus to go out walk into that world and to transform it with Jesus. We can't do it ourselves. All the human efforts to transform the world, to make it better. Oh, we're going to be better. Oh, the, it's an evolution. It's going to get better in each generation. I've been through three or four generations myself at the age of 94, and we're in the generation I began in, the time of depression, it was pretty bad. But looking back on it, it's better. The relationships, the connection we had, the effort of going to church, the effort of praying, where everybody went to church. So we were low on the human elements and we were high on the divine elements and the hope we were working with the, the divine culture love believe have faith and hope in God and require Stand on the foundation of Jesus, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance, the virtues on which we stand in order to establish ourselves. And things will be better. And things, in a certain sense, were better. But there was a, was a continuous later movement up and down of deterioration. And that deterioration is what we are in now. There's a lack of faith of seeing things in the way of Jesus. There's a lack of acting in his way. There's a break in the Christian relationship among Christians. And there is a fear. There's a cultural fear that we cannot overcome the human culture based on the seven capital sins. The seven capital sins, the seven heads, serpent heads of the dragon in the, in the book of Revelation. Pride, where we say that we are above God, we know more than God, that it's our will be done in this world and that God's will be done. Lust, using, abusing, of love, or should be based on the love of God, love in ourselves, 
love of the human race, to help, to help and assist. Instead, we have words that sound that way, but actions are against it. And it comes to the, the anger, anger, division, war, destroying, trying to force, watching for our territory. We're not one nation under God. We are separate nations, separate thoughts, separate cultures, each one antagonism for antagonistic to each other to claim their territory and destroy the others. Why? So that we can establish seven capital sins in our own lives. Greed. Greed. Territory. Pleasure. Where we even destroy our own lives in gluttony. We are not even safe and healthy in our own lives. And we actually look for things to forget, to be self-contained, to be so self-focused. And that's what gluttony does. It's a self-focus on the self and the destruction of even our talents that God gave us to to act and progress. And then envy. And it's envidia. The word is really not the modern word envy, but envidia of putting others down who are trying to raise up, to put the, the persons who witness down, to destroy them, that they are reckoning that they're contrary to the human culture which is exactly true. They, we are contrary to the human culture. But we are not invidious. We want to lift up those humans in that culture into the divine culture. And we will do it with the courage and the action and power of Je the me method of Jesus Christ, the process of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit and doing the will of the Father. And sloth. Capital sin of sloth. Oh, it's not my duty. It's somebody else's. It's those who are saintly. Those who are inspired. Those who now connect. We are all to be saints. Sloth is saying that we are not to be saints. That we are not Jesus connected. And the only way to sanctity is to be Jesus connected because he is the Holy One. He's the one that brings us back to the Father. He's the one with the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit to activate, to be activated, and to get rid of this human culture which will end with the end of the world. It ends in the end of your world. This is the only time you have to do it. Jesus says, do it while you are in the light. Do it while you are active. Use your talents. Do not be slow. Each one is given that talent. Each one is given that, not only that permission, but that command. When the gospel says that Jesus came into this world when it was predicted of him. He was called a sign of contradiction. And he is. He's a sign of contradiction. He's kind of contradicted to all the ways that the human world and any human involvement, even of his communities, that do not reflect him are to be contradicted. He contradicts it. His power and his graces are to be used positively. And if we do not use them, we contradict his sign. And his sign is a sign of, of effort 
of goodness, of all connection, but it is also in this world a sign of contradiction, a sign of crucifixion. This cross is at once a sign of contradiction by the world, what the spirit of the world, what the cultures of this world would do to us, but it is also a sign of victory because he came down from the cross. They try to bury him. They try to get rid of him, to eliminate him, but he resurrected. And we are the resurrected Christians. Yes, in this life, we will suffer. What happened to him in the Gospels will also happen to us. So what are we saying to each person? Start now. If you haven't started, some of us have started. The saints have started. We have the examples, even our own generation, of saints who have started. In our culture, in our knowledge, our experience, we have, like, for instance, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, who had to learn how to follow the will of God in the world fearlessly among pagans to lift them up from what they were, to see Jesus in the lowest type of pagans, the ones who were rejected, the ones who were put under their feet physically in the gutters of India to lift them up and say, no, God loves you. You are our brothers and sisters. We are all children of God. You don't know it, and I'm going to show it in my life with you. We not only are going to show them the face of Jesus, but when we look at them, we see the face of Jesus, the face of God, in the person that we lift up. Nebulous now and becoming real and real as they find human dignity that God gave us in creation when he made us first in his image. We're not in his image in the physical. We are human creatures, human animals. We look at a person and we don't see the person. We see his humanness. We see his human features, his human defects, his connection to the human culture. When we look at him, we have to begin to see the face of Jesus disfigured. We have to wipe it clean. We have to be clean wiped in the Holy Spirit for them to see it. That is witnessing. So it's urgent. And Jesus not only gives us the permission to do it, he gives us the command to do it. Go into the world. Teach them. Preach to them. Talk to them. Show them in yourself that there is a new life, a new way, a new truth, a new, a new road, and the road is Jesus Christ. They're already on a road. Every person in this world has a religion. They say, oh, they just religion and non-religion. Atheism and Christianity. No, atheism is a religion. When you are have an attitude and you have an action that connects you to what people see in your life, that is your religion. That's what we want to know. We have a Christian religion. People have, others have a satanic religion. 
So the leaders in our church, not just have declared something, evangelization, that is witnessing. A new Pentecost, a new witnessing, a new life. And Pope Paul VI, that I saw in my own life and witnessed to him with my Bible, attended his, his talk where he was witnessing to the world. And I received that word in the scripture. When you don't know what to say, but you're not sure where you're at, open up that scripture. Open up that Bible. Open it anywhere that God shows you. And read it. And see where what it says to you. Open up that Bible. That is your plan of life. That is your book process. That is what tells you what to do. Open it up anywhere. Put your finger on it. Like St. Francis did. Like the saints did. Say, how typical to engage in defensive and lack of de devout, respectable ability. Working on the capital sins instead of moving to the virtues. There it is. Each time you look at the scriptures, each time you to talk to God in Lectio Divina, each time that you listen to his word, each time that you apply it to yourself and then put it down to others. It's a letter of God to you. You're writing a letter each day, a page each day of your letter to God. What did I do today to promote God? So when I met with Paul the Sixth, and I had my working Bible there and it had on the cover an emblem and it pasted on the cover that says Jesus the one way to God. Sounds great. Sounds great. But the Pope looked at that and he said no. It's not one way. There not is another way. There not is another Messiah. There is not another religious leader that has everything. It's the only way. And he, then he said it in Italian. Gesù eh, non è una via. Una via. One way. An adjective. It's not an adjective. It's an adverb. The only way. L'unico senso. L'unica senso. The only way. And that is where we say we have to be Jesus-centered. This is something that is so misunderstood. When you look at the example of the saints, when Mother Teresa, when I met with Mother Teresa in India and in America and talking to her, and we're mutually witnessing. That's a, called a dialogue. And I'm telling her, who I am, where I am in the Lord, and what I wish to do in my witnessing. And she was just telling everyone who she was, who, what she was doing, how she was witnessing the Lord, and how to, and in connecting to Jesus, connecting to each other. And there it is, my inspiration. And she says, I'll pray for you, for your witnessing. For what you do. People say, oh, you met Mother Teresa? We meet Jesus Christ every day. We also meet his witnesses. Then Paul VI wrote this encyclical, this encyclical on evangelization. And this encyclical on evangelization tells us all different ways to do it, all numbered, all different ways, 80 different ways, 80 different 
seg segments of how to do it. And how does he entitle that? He entitles it as the witness of Jesus Christ. Going out and witnessing. But go out of yourself, go inside yourself, go see Jesus, put him inside yourself, and then go out. And so, you say, it's urgent. The world needs Pentecost. The world is super messed up. Look around you. They're not blind, even as a human being, to see what's happening. In our, even in our churches, within the walls of the church and outside those walls, in the culture, Jesus is not proclaimed. Is not given enough temple uh, time. If I were to say a scripture that the Lord gave me, it's dry bones. Dry bones. Ezekiel's dry bones. We are today a secularized Christianity in a great part. When bishops proclaim to us and say to us, and we see it on EWTN, they say, even 30% of the people who go to communion do not believe it is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. They are not sacramental. Those who are baptized do not believe that they are priests of God, lay priests of God, to connect people and themselves to God, to proclaim him, to teach him. They're confirmed, but they lack the action of the Holy Spirit. It's just a little slap on the face and not a talking of the Holy, with the Holy Spirit courageously. It's a secularized Christianity. It's a combined secular Christianity to a great part. Statistics will give us all different kinds of percentages. And those percentages in our present day is going down, down, down for God and up, up, up for the human culture. We are dry bone. How can we renew? We have to be reborn. Reborn in Jesus Christ. Reborn. Re-enfleshed. re, re We have to speak Jesus. 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 And not hold back in the public square. Recently, there was a webinar of the a Catholic organization, which will go unnamed. And in it, they're talking about all how to renew people, how to restore people, how their objective is to restore them. They have Catholic or Christian written in their names and their organizations. And yet, when they speak of it, even on television, even on videos, they do not even mention the word Jesus. They mention other human beings who have some movement, some good movement towards Jesus and others who actually neglect Jesus. Actually are dry bone Christians. Secularized. So we have to look to see who we are and what we have to become. We have to become. When Jesus inflects, infle infleshes us so that people can see Jesus in us in witness, each generation community directly, daily in his life must proclaim Jesus. We are baptized. We are confirmed. Are we catechized? Do we 
absorb his teaching. Even persons who go, who are adults, who are converted, baptized, they are actually silenced. They are not, they are not the father's human witnesses. They are faithless witnesses. They witness humanity. They do not witness God. They are, we are silenced, a silenced church. So look into one's own personal position with Jesus. Be honest. You don't have to expose those things to others. Write a letter to Jesus and tell him who you believe you are in his light, in the light of his gospel. Do you really believe that every Christian is called to witness? Do you believe you have a plan? Do you believe the gospel is your plan? Do you believe you are with Jesus and you can act in his way? That you can act against the secularism that is out there, the secularism that you have, but you are losing with repentance. You're buried in the world with your repentance and baptism. It is not a subjective Christianity. It is an objective Christianity. And how objective is it? Let me give you five modes, five modes of witness, activated reach out. First, going out. Mission means to be sent, to go out. Jesus came out on a mission to us from the Father. We go, he sends us out on a mission to paganism. He goes out modeled. He is the model. When God created man, he gave man a human model. Let us make man in our image. Not like the snakes, not like the dinosaurs, not like the apes, not like the fish, but in our model. Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are the model of God, but we are in human creature form. But we go out and model. How do you model? The first thing you have to do is connect. The human thing is to connect. The apostles didn't go out just to walk around and say, I am an apostle of Jesus. I was sent out by him. You have to see what is in front of them. To connect to the situation in your, uh, ahead of you that you see even with your eyes. Begin to see with the, what it can become with the eyes of faith. So you're connecting. You're connecting through a dialogue, through a communication, through a reach out. That's what Jesus did. He went out from one place to the other. He repeated it. He went to the same places the same time at, at different times until he went out to the cross and gave the final witness, a final reach out. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's not, it's not a condemning witness, not a pointing finger to condemn what people are doing. They know what they're doing that is condemned. When they see the light of Christ, they'll see the shadows in their own lives. It's a, a discipling. To go out is to disciple, to teach, to see people 
not only as equal to us in, in, in the eyes of God, as coming from God, but we also see that they are children who do not know God. They are lambs, black sheep. They are, or they are seeking sheep. There are sheep out there, bye, bye, bye. I don't know where I'm going. Protect me against the wolves. When you see that, you disciple. What you learn from Jesus, you pass on to them. You're not there to pass on your defects, your limitations. You're going to act that Jesus will do it. That he has helped to raise you up. Notice that when you have witnesses of Jesus Christ, the saints, they're not afraid to admit that they were something else at one time. But they're not in it now. They were fishes of fish. And now they are fishes of men. They have grown. They have been renewed. In Jesus Christ. Reborn. That's what Jesus said. Read in the scriptures. Him and Nicodemus. But we are not closet Christians anymore. Two great closet Christians that were disciples of Jesus Christ secretly, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus came out of their closets by standing with him at the cross. By going to Pilate, defying the Pharisees, and going to Pilate and says, give us his body. He will resurrect in three days. He said he would resurrect in three days. Oh, no. But the others were saying, the human culture was saying, no, put guards at the, at the tomb. Don't eliminate him. Don't bury him. Destroy him. Throw him into Gehenna and even destroy his body. Don't give him back to his mother. But Pilate had a glimpse of God's work in him. He was not be completely betrayed by God. His angel said to him, give him the body. Bury, bury him. Okay, put the guard on. Put the guard on. So nobody goes and pretends that he resurrected. It doesn't work. Human culture doesn't work. It only works in a temporal moment. In a diabolical moment. It's time is over. The devil has to know he's scared. He's going to run away. Before Jesus. Before the cross. He runs away. His time is over with. His effort is lost. He tried to make himself God. As people do. It's gone. You can't do it. The proof of the continuance of the Satan in the world shows he cannot do it. He cannot win. But he can momentarily draw people to himself. So now you have to disciple. That's why we have religious orders. That's why we have saints who have gone out who established this is the way of Jesus. But you notice that with all the different religious orders, they're all the same. They're all the same. Some will call themselves Jesuits. Society of Jesus. Oh, we can't say we are the company of Jesus. We are the society of Jesus. We are the family of Jesus. The people turn away around Jesuits. And they try to give it some kind of negativity. We are Franciscans. No, Jesus said, we're not Franciscans. We are the image of Jesus, the human image of Jesus. Our way, our truth, and our life is to be Jesus. What is our rule of life? Don't give us human rules. We already have a rule. The rule is the gospel. 
can I, he goes to the Pope and says, is it okay if I proclaim the gospel of my life as I see it in Jesus? What he told me, and that crucifix, the crucifix at Porciuncula. Go and rebuild my church. Francis, you're nobody, but you're somebody when you, you are with me. You are my image. And he gave us he gave us a human image, you know, St. Francis. He gave us a human image. He's the one who gave us the image of the Jesus in, in the crib. And he's the one who ended up being the image of the crucifixion, from crib to crucifixion. The gospel, Jesus. But the saints did that in mystical ways in active ways. Here, no, not enough priests in, in Northern Italy, in Italy, to proclaim Jesus. Here comes John Bosco. And in his lifetime, on a statistic, he brings 6,000 persons into holy orders with his direct influence. He hasn't stopped yet. So whatever name we give to a religious order, it all is Jesus. It's all the family of Jesus. And we're all one. Whenever you, you hear anything of one religious order contradicting another or saying they're not as good as we are, we got more saints than you have, and all that kind of stuff, that is all holy baloney. If you're not, you're either with Jesus or away from Jesus. Whether you're a religious order, whether you're a nun, or you are a lay person, those are all human divisions. There's no division in God. There's no division. And when we all go to the fifth temple in heaven, we're all one. All the other human elements will disappear. We won't have to have a special habit. We won't have to have a special name on our, on our, on our name. All we are will have the image of Jesus Christ right in our heads, in our hearts, because we will be the image of Jesus and we'll sit down at his table. So look at yourself today, viewer. How much of you does Jesus own? How much of you is the image of Jesus? Is your, are your eyes the eyes of Jesus? Is your mouth the mouth of Jesus? Is that what comes out of your mouth? Is your heart an expression of Jesus. He opened his heart on the cross to pour out himself on this world. Look at the Virgin Mary if you want to witness. She hasn't given up in 2,000 years. She keeps coming back. He says, go out. She's up there. Or she's with God. Well, she's everywhere if she's with God. God is everywhere. Jesus is everywhere. But she keeps coming back in physical form to remind us to do exactly what is said in the gospel. No a new message. No big secrets. The secret is, who are you? So that's the goal. What is our nationality? What is our country? We live in Jesus land. The world is Jesus land. God gave the world. He formed us to be his children. He gave us even this world to be his home on earth. But the real home, the perfect home, is the home above with Jesus. 
And you know what it's going to look like? What are you going to look like when you get to heaven? We're all going to look like Jesus. God has no other sons. Amen. God bless you. Holy Spirit, give us Jesus. Father, you gave us Jesus. Give us Jesus in ourselves. There are all different ways that persons have done that. How do you go out? You go out personally. You go out in a community. You go out to everyone in the world. And if you can't actually physically go out, write a book and keep it going. God bless you. The book is, whatever book has been written, thousands of books have been written, as John says in his book, words of his gospel, the last words of his gospel. If there is a book to be written about Jesus, he says, I wrote this gospel, I wrote this gospel, but all the books of the world could not contain it. All the books of the world could not contain it. They're being published every day, everywhere, always. The greatest not only the greatest book ever written, but the greatest books. And the greatest book that you can write is the book that Jesus writes in your heart. God bless. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Romal, very much. That was very instructive and inspiring, and it spoke to my heart. And I would like to uh, share with our listeners, our viewers, those that are present and those that will see this uh, video in the future, um, that they can contact um, Jesus Centric Institute via our website to listen to all of Rommel's uh, 64 uh, videos on the Gospel of John, also his set of videos on the letters of John and Revelation. Um, which are a Lectio Divina, verse by verse, companion to the series that is authored, Bible, Love Letters from Your Father, Books of John. It has been a pleasure to have you here, Romald, and to uh, absorb your insights and your Jesus witness. Thank you for witnessing Jesus to us. And feel free to look us up at Jesus Centered Institute. God bless you all. Thank you. The mission of Holy Apostles College and Seminary is to form faithful witnesses of Christ. Year after year, the prestigious Newman Guide has recommended Holy Apostles for our academic excellence and steadfast fidelity to the magisterial teachings of the Catholic Church. We are also fully accredited and the leader in Catholic online learning. Our students enjoy the unsurpassed flexibility to study on their own time and anywhere in the world through asynchronous engagement. Holy Apostles is dedicated to the relentless pursuit of truth, which allows students in all academic programs, including undergraduate, graduate, and personal interest, to formulate a coherent worldview based on both faith and reason. The study of the liberal arts also develops and refines key competencies associated with career readiness, such as critical thinking and problem solving, clear communication, collaboration, and a strong work ethic. The tuition rate at Holy Apostles is one of the most affordable in the country. Yearly tuition for a full-time undergraduate is under $12,000. Students at Holy Apostles can graduate with minimal or even no college debt which enables them to live out their calling as faithful witnesses of Christ without heavy financial burdens holding them back. Please visit www.holyapostles.edu forward slash admissions for more information. The fall 2021 admissions deadline is Friday, July 23rd. Classes start Monday, August 30th. See you soon. 
Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.